If you're tired of struggling to write prompts in Bolt, Lovable, or Replit, I've just solved your problem. I built a copilot that lives right in your browser so you can craft powerful prompts without needing to master prompt engineering. Just explain what you're trying to do in simple words and let AI do the heavy lifting. From setting up your first foundational prompt to providing mid-conversation feedback, this is the perfect prompt buddy you've always wished you had. Instead of waiting on the companies themselves to come up with this feature, you can take matters into your own hands and have this working in seconds. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how it works, how you can use it, and lastly, how I built it. Let's get into it. All right, so what I actually built is a Chrome extension. And you can see at the very top, I have a pencil icon here, and you'll see that on all three websites, Lovable, Bolt, and Replit, you'll also see the same pencil right there. So if you go on Bolt and you go on Replit, you'll see that same pencil icon over and over again. Now, how does it work? If you go and click on the pencil icon, you can enter your OpenAI API key, and then you can select the model of choice, and this model will be the brain powering your own mini prompt engineer. Once you make a selection, let's say we choose 4.1 mini, you can choose either a generic system prompt that I've already pre-baked for you over here, or you can customize it towards the specific platforms. So let's say I wanna choose Lovable as my first one. And if you're curious on how to best prompt engineer these different platforms, I literally released a two hour masterclass on how to vibe code A to Z. So you might wanna check that out before you look at this video. In the meantime, if we pick Lovable and we say that this is my first prompt, what this feature does is it makes this initial prompt a lot more foundational. You can imagine your first prompt in any of these platforms as if you're having a conversation with a junior software engineer where you provide them a project plan and that project plan really shapes the way they're gonna build that product. If you just say something like, build me a to-do list app with no additional description, that junior software engineer is gonna be pretty lost as to exactly which direction they should go in to design and build the functionality of that product. So by checking the, this is my first prompt section of this modal, this will tell the AI behind the scenes to add an additional layer to the system prompt to make it that much more robust. Next up, if you wanna output the prompt in markdown format, you can check this. If not, you can uncheck it. And then since we provided Lovable as the platform, this is the system prompt. And what I did is I made it fully editable. So if you go through this and you wanna change the way it's broken down, then you can do so at your heart's content. And the last part is the most important part where you put your rough idea in the most simplified layman's terms possible. So to test this out, let's say we say something like this. I want to build an app that connects AI entrepreneurs and business leaders. Okay, and then we'll just click promptify and we'll see what happens. It's gonna go apply the system prompt and then act as a prompt engineer with a specific specialization in Lovable and come back with a prompt that it auto-populates in Lovable itself. How cool is that? So you can go through here and you can see all the main features it's going through, the event calendar, etc., admin dashboard, the database schema it should follow. Because it's Lovable, it knows we're gonna most likely be using Superbase. And as you go down, it gives you a lot more notes on how it should design this app. Now, if you want the prompt to look a lot more structured, what you can do is we can repeat that exact same instruction right here. And then this time we'll just make sure we say output in markdown format. And once again, we will just click promptify and then it will do its magic and then come back. But this time with markdown denoting every single section of that exact same prompt. And you can see here, it comes up with a title and now we have every section segmented with bolding, etc. So it's easy for us to read it and hopefully even easier for Lovable to read it itself. Now, like I said before, I didn't just make this for Lovable. I also designed it to work on the Bolt webpage as well as Replit. And it works, again, not just on your first prompt, but any prompt that is in the middle of the conversation. So if we go into Bolt, into an app that I was halfway through making, if I looked at this dashboard and said, you know what, there's too much blue. I could use their internal feature here called Enhanced Prompt right here, or we could use Promptify, and then we can unclick, this is my first prompt, so it won't be as verbose, and it won't be obsessed with setting the tone for creating a whole project plan. It will just try to take my very poorly worded caveman wording and turn it into something that the AI can better understand. So if I say something like, there's way too much blue on this dashboard, right? We take something like that. I'll say, let's make it designed for Bolt and let's use 4.1 mini and then click promptify right here. It should do its thing and once again, paste it directly in the chat. And voila, we have a beautiful prompt here. We can remove the whole bolt part right there. But now it's taken our very minimal instruction and basically said, replace excessive blue tones on the dashboard with a balanced modern color palette. Now do you need 
all of this necessarily? Probably not. So you could probably cut out a portion of it, right? And then just leave something like this, send it over, and then it'll make your whole prompting journey a lot easier. And just like that, we have a view now that is not as blue. We have some more greens, we have some distribution of colors, and we took a very caveman worded prompt and made it a lot more verbose and detailed for the end using AI. And last but not least, just to show you that it also works on Replit, we can go there, click on Promptify, and say something like, build me a dashboard with different icons and different slide tiles that I can use to analyze every part of my coaching business using AI. Okay, we say something like that. This time we can leave it as generic or we could put it on Replit as well. You'll see this one is very specialized and then we'll take, let's say 4.1 nano and then we'll do promptify and then we'll see what happens. Once again, it works perfectly here and you'll see that this description is a lot more technical where it's telling Replit very specific specifications on how the components should be structured, what different files there should be and the overall breakdown without being as verbose and descriptive on the UI and design, which is usually not Replit's strong point. It's really good for functional builds and making more sophisticated builds using its own in-house software. So now we know that it works, but let's now take a look at how it works. So we're jumping into Miro and I'll walk you through my entire thought process through building this. Now, when it comes to what I built it with, I didn't use any of the off the shelf apps. I actually used Windsurf, which is very similar to Cursor. Now, if you don't know what Windsurf is, it's basically a more code and development friendly version of those apps that I just showed you. And it can go a lot deeper in terms of building very meaningful functionality. And it's a lot easier to test and go back and forth with because you have all of the files at your disposal. So these tools are optimized to speak to all kinds of files that come together to build this application. And the reason why it's a lot easier to use Windsurf for this than let's say ChatGPT 03 is because 03 will output some form of zip file full of files. And for something a lot more complex than a basic Chrome extension, you'll need to go back and forth quite a few times. So you can imagine every single time you made a change in ChatGPT, you'd have to repackage it, then unzip it, then upload it to Google Chrome, and then see if it's exactly what you're looking for and go back and forth in this circle. If you use Windsurf, it will create a new file folder, and this folder will always be in constant communication with Google Chrome. So as things need to be updated or bugs needs to be squashed, this will constantly communicate with this file here, which exactly will be able to be reloaded very seamlessly in Google Chrome. And this is a good example of when to use the right tool for the right job. There are times where Bolt, Lovable, and Replit will take you from A to Z for the perfect prototype. But if you want to build something that's truly functional and needs a lot of iterations, no matter how smart the AI is on the other end of the software, it's really good to be able to use Windsurf. And another reason why Windsurf is a really good choice here is you can switch between different language models. So if your project starts out and you just want to brainstorm, you could use something like Grok, which is a lot more creative. And then as the project progresses, you can switch to maybe using Gemini 2.5 Pro, which is now exceptional at coding and it's Google, right? So it's aware of how to build most likely a Chrome extension a lot better than OpenAI. So you can now start to use the right tool for the job and the right language models for the job while you're building the application, which is a very potent use case. Now, if we get more tactical, this is how the app works at a very high level. We have some Chrome extension in Google Chrome and pretty much the only service we're invoking is the OpenAI API, just to send that request depending on which tier of model we had to provide. And obviously while building this in Windsurf, I had to give a bit of a cheat sheet on how to call certain models because things like Gemini, Anthropic, and OpenAI are cut off in terms of their training as of a year plus ago. So they don't even know some of these new models like GPT 4.1, 4.1 Mini Nano, 4.5, etc. The next piece we have to focus on was getting the actual extension to not only generate the prompt once we ask for it, but actually place that prompt in the exact text box for that particular website. Now you might think that once you solve this text box thing once, you're good to go. But because of the placement and the structure of the HTML, CSS, JavaScript of all of these different website platforms, dealing with this text box looked a little bit different on each one of them. So this is the part where I say it takes a lot of testing because as soon as it worked on Lovable, I thought it would work on Bolt. But then surprise, surprise, the UI was a bit different. So I had to switch the code using AI, obviously, I didn't write any code myself, to make sure it's formatted for the Bolt user interface. And the same thing with Replit, because it was located in a different way, the pencil showed up on like the ceiling of the web page instead of the actual text box. So we had to go back and forth 
to get that specific functionality dialed in. And in the same way, if you notice when I click on that pencil, we got some form of pop-up. We had to make sure that that pop-up didn't go over any of the headers in each website. And because the sizing and the structure and the layout of those web pages are ever so slightly different, we also had to accommodate for that as well. Now, if we take an x-ray machine and take a look at Promptify, you can see that there's four core components. There is a manifest, and you can think of a manifest as the same thing as a manifest on a flight, where it tells you the entire flight path of how you get from point A to point B. And this is basically the same thing, but for this Google Chrome extension, where it's telling it how it's going to navigate a different functionality, what should be the user interaction, etc. And next is the background script, which is actually the brains of the Chrome extension, which is where you're gonna specify things like how do you call the OpenAI API? What do you do with the payload or response from that API once you receive it? And the last two are pretty straightforward. The content script is basically your helper on the page where it breaks down how things look, where they're located, etc. And the CSS styles is really the look and feel. So if you remember when I click Promptify, you get this rainbow looking gradient across the page, and then you get a green success once it's done running. All of that in terms of the styling is all determined by the CSS styles files. Now, if we wanna take one step further down the ladder, this is what the more critical tactical steps look like. So like we said, the AI comes up with a manifest file, and then it comes up with a background and content JS file. Once we have those working, we then obsess over how to create the user interface and the initial styling, although we're gonna go back and forth quite a few times. And this is where you start to specify things like create some open text box that will allow the user to enter an API key. And usually you'd think it would be smart enough to know when you enter it, it should keep it somewhere in your Google Chrome. But typically what happens is it will allow you to enter it once, and as soon as you unclick that pop-up, it goes away. And that's really annoying to you as a user. So now you need to start going back and forth on what's called persistence, where when you go from one browser, bolt.new, to lovable, it will remember that you had an API key that you applied, and it shouldn't actually flush it out of memory. And these are the types of things that take the longest in vibe coding. Building the general structure, letting it work and speak to Google Chrome is one part, but getting it to do exactly what you want in the way you want it is the next level. And the next step, it comes down to the core crux of our app, which is the prompt engineering. Step one is, can we create some system prompt that we can edit that will allow us to create a prompt? Step one. Step two, can we take that prompt and automatically place it in the text box? And then step three is getting to more fancy nuance, which was that option I showed you, which is not just markdown output, but delineating between a first prompt and a mid-conversation type of prompt so that you don't have basically an essay every single time you send a prompt, which isn't very conducive to one token usage as well as the general hallucination tendencies of language models. Once that's figured out, now we have to worry about, okay, so this pop-up is working, it's running, it's pasting the prompt in the right place. How does this look like and how does this interact with the entire web page? So now we start obsessing at one step above which is how do we put all the pieces together so that there's some symbiosis in the user interface. And step five is the step that takes the most time. No matter what you do, no matter how good you are at prompt engineering, whether it's on Lovable, Windsurf, or Cursor, which is the constant iterative UI refinement and bug fixing. And when it came to Windsurf, it took me around three to four hours to get the core components of the application working exactly how I wanted them, comma, consistently. Meaning I didn't have some form of whack-a-mole where I would build one thing, fix one thing, and then the original thing I built would break. And that happens quite a bit with vibe coding, which is why you don't only need patience, but you need to be able to easily provide feedback, which is why I dictate a lot when I speak, so that I don't have to type very lazy cave person instructions. I try to give as much nuance and detail as to what I'm seeing as possible. And finally, step six is the very last part. This is the part where you do some visual enhancements now that the core functionality is working. And just note that even if you're basically editing surface level colors or designs or gradients, it can still find a way, because it's a language model, to rewrite code that it shouldn't write in other files and basically break everything. So even in this step, you need to be careful with exactly what you're targeting and how you're targeting it. Now, just jumping into Windsurf, I am not gonna walk through the battlefield of all the back and forths I had with the language model, but I just wanted to give you a preview of what this looks like in its end state. So you have some folder here that we created on my desktop, and then you have all the components that make up the folder that I can just import into Google Chrome. So you can see we have all the icons for the little pencil on the top toolbar, as well as the pencil on each and every text box. 
And then like we said, we have the background JS, content JS, we have the manifest file, we have the prompt templates themselves. So all the system prompts that pop up by default are in here. So if you wanted to take the files and edit them, all you'd have to do is just edit the underlying prompts here, or you could tell Windsurf using whatever model you want to use, again, which is why I love using Windsurf, is I can pick from any one of these to then go and edit this specific file. And it's helpful if I tell it, hey, go edit the prompt templates JSON file and then make lovables prompt into XYZ. Now, if this is intimidating you just looking at this screen, I can tell you that I wrote none of this code myself. All I did was provide feedback. This entire code base itself is based off of an empty folder that it put together. We go into a blank slate. This is what Windsurf looks like when you log in. And it's actually free to use for a while until you decide whether or not it fits in your stack. But all you have to do is technically go create a folder. So you could create one and call it promptify dose. Okay. And then we can go on open folder. It'll go into that section. So let's go into the subfolder we have here, YouTube. Then we can go promptify dose. Once we've opened that up, we've technically created a brand new repository. It's going to warm up. We can choose our language model of choice. So let's say we do Claude 3.7 Sonnet. If I tell it, build me a Chrome extension that will allow me to enter a prompt in OpenAI and get back some form of response with a spinning icon while we wait for the actual API call. Okay. This could be your initial prompt that we send over. And the same way you could just load in a folder, let's say the files to create this Chrome extension and just say, Hey, for this folder, I want to change this, this, and this. And then it has access to the entire code base and it can make the manipulations and edits to the file itself. And after five minutes, it's put together all of these files here to create this new Chrome extension. And notice how we have yet another new manifest.json file and it took care of all the heavy lifting. So for us to import this in Google Chrome is actually not that difficult. We could just go into here and all you have to do is go to Chrome colon double slash extensions. You'll see all your extensions right here. You'll see promptify is right there. If you want to load the new extension we put together, we can go to load unpacked, go to promptify dose, touch this folder, select. And now we have something. And if you wanted a quick preview of what it looks like, you could just go into here, go and look for the OpenAI prompt helper. Now you have this icon. You can click on it. You can see right here, we now have a placeholder for the OpenAI key and your prompt. Will it work? Probably not, but this is where you'll go back and forth with Windsurf. And the cool thing is anytime you update the files, all you have to do is click on reload and you'll be able to see the latest version of that Chrome extension. And with that, I've now shown you how you can create a Chrome extension to make your vibe coding life that much easier and how it works and how you can use Windsurf to create Chrome extensions to increase the quality of life in all kinds of apps, not just the one I showed you as well. And if you're a fan of vibe coding in general, then you might want to check the second link in the description below where I have a community where we do vibe coding, prompt engineering, edit and make and anything you can imagine in the AI space. And we're actually hosting a hackathon this upcoming weekend with cash prizes with different teams working together to build the best apps possible. If that sounds interesting, then maybe I'll see you inside there. And for everyone else, I'll see you next time.